This work is joint work with uh, Kelvin McQueen and Marcus Mueller. Um, and also, I will be just mentioning briefly some work I did with um, Robert Brentner, who's sitting here, and Larissa Albentakis, which is on a quantum extension of, of IIT. Um, oops, hang on. There we go. So um, Will gave a nice introduction to Wigner's friend. I'll just very briefly go over it again. Um, Wigner's original paper, if you, if you read it, what Wigner's original paper was really about was this idea of um, when does a wave function collapse when someone makes an observation? Um, is, it, is it when the friend makes the measurement or is it when Wigner learns about the value of the outcome of the measurement? If it's the latter, this kind of suggests that you could have a superposition of conscious states, right? Because if Wigner doesn't, if, if Wigner doesn't know um, until, you know, if, if the wave function itself doesn't collapse until Wigner finds out, then there, you could have this possibility of conscious states. Um, so Wigner was really trying to answer this question of whether consciousness had some kind of uh, causal effect. Um, and he says that, uh, so he, he talks about two arguments for um, there being, a, a, for consciousness having sort of a causal, um, if, uh, the ability to have cause-effect power. And he says that, the, and the first is, I'm not going to talk about it. The second is, to support the existence of an influence of consciousness on the physical world, it's based on this observation that, um, we don't know of any phenomenon where you have some kind of uh, influence that goes one way. So if consciousness can have a, uh, a, a causal effect on the physical world, then subsequently it would make sense that the physical world should have a, uh, an effect, can, can have a causal effect on consciousness and vice versa. So, we don't know of any effect that, that only goes one direction, right? So this was sort of one of the motivating factors between, behind what he was looking at. And he basically wants to know, can consciousness collapse the wave function? Of course, this combines two really possible problems, the first being, what is consciousness? And the second being, what is the wave function? Um, and so why not take on two impossible problems in one fell swoop? So I'm going to, we, we looked at this in the, uh, context of integrated information theory, um, which, by the way, we are not IIT apologists. We just, it's the most cited um, theory of consciousness that, that we are aware of. I guess it depends on what you consider a theory of consciousness. Um, so it's the one that we decided to work with because it's the, it's the one that um, is most well known. And it's also, I mentioned that um, I had, I had done a uh, quantum extension of it with Robert and uh, Larissa Albentakis this year, and so it sort of lent itself naturally to that. So I can summarize IIT very briefly as follows. So IID, IIT treats consciousness as a measurable quantity. You can debate whether that's a possible thing or not, um, but that's how IIT works. The amount of, con of consciousness in a physical system is called its integrated information. It's given by a capital phi, um, there is a, or big phi. There is a small phi, which is uh, cause-effect information. And that is, uh, you, you put this, the small phi together to get the big phi. Um, a qualitative state, or qualia, of a physical system is given by its phi structure, which um, Kelvin and Dave Chalmers, so Kelvin, along with Dave Chalmers, has a, a very lengthy paper that um, uh, actually Johannes helped out with as well, where they, they introduce a, a, a collapse model. And in their paper, they refer to these qualia spaces as Q-shapes. That In the IIT literature, they're not called Q-shapes. Um, in IIT 3.0, they're called um, mice. Um, and in, in uh, 4.0, they're called, um, I think they're just called phi structures, um, but uh, Dave and Kelvin call them Q-shapes. Um, and IIT, what it does is it provides a mathematical formalism for calculating these um, in both the classical and now the quantum cases. There are actually three sort of quant quantum versions of IIT out there in a sense. There is a 
paper by Zanardi many years ago that introduces a quantum IIT, but that particular model does not reduce to the classical model with classical inputs. So if you put classical inputs into Zanardi's model, you don't get classical IIT out. There's a sort of broad overview paper that Johannes and Chantal um, wrote that looks sort of places IIT and quantum IIT in a larger context. And then there's this paper by Larissa and Robert and myself from earlier this year that looks at the quantum, uh, sort of takes a, develops a quantum IAT at least from a single mechanism standpoint. It's not complete. So IIT has a bunch of axioms and postulates. I don't want to go through all of them. Um, in particular, though, I'm going to highlight uh, two. It starts from this axiom of existence. There is something. It, IIT, in that sense, is kind of a, a Cartesian thing. That's an axiom. The postulate, the physical postulate that comes out of that axiom is cause, effect, power. The, its units have to take and make a difference. In addition, um, the, the, and the axioms, by the way, are about experience. So it starts from this, uh, the standpoint of experience as a, a, a means of saying something about the world. So the integration axiom says that experience is um, wholly, whole and irreducible to separate, separate pieces, meaning I'm experiencing this room right now I'm experiencing it as a single whole, right? I'm not experiencing the chair separately from the podium. They're part of this, this whole ex single irreducible experience that I'm having. Um, I may experience them separately in separate instances in the sense that if I walk into a room and I look at the chair and I see the chair and then I turn around and I see the podium, those are really different experiences because I... I, I saw the chair first, my experience was of the chair and the things in my visual field and my other sensory fields surrounding that. Then I turn and I experience the, the table. But I, I could experience them simultaneously as I'm doing now. I'm you know, catching one out of the corner of this eye and one out of the corner of this eye. So it's a, there, it's a whole. To put it another way, we, do, we assume that we don't have um, this is basically the assumption that we don't have superpositions of experiences, right? I'm not experiencing two separate things simultaneously. It just, nobody's ever, as far as I know, although we did have an interesting discussion about this at dinner last night regarding schizophrenia, but. So, the basic, in IIT, the absolute basic um, thing that has consciousness, this, this was uh, Dave Chalmers and, and Calvin McQueen developed this in their paper. It's, they call it the feedback dyad. So it's, a, it's IIT's minimally conscious system. And what it is, is it's essentially, so in the, for, for the moment, ignore the bottom part. So the top part comes from uh, Chalmers and McQueen. And what, a, what the um, minimally conscious system is, the feedback diet, is it's two nodes, A and B. They both have binary states. It's active or inactive, um, if the nodes are neurons. And both are individually copy gates. At each time step, A and B swap states. Now, it turns out that there's another way of looking at this, and I'll explain in a minute why it's important. You can actually view this instead as a uh, two channels, A and B, which are defined in terms of their, their, their location in space-time. Um, and each of them has a binary state, one or zero, and they're related by a swap gate. And, and then the output from this just feeds back into the input. So at every time step, you take the swap gate, put stuff in, and then stuff comes out, and you feed it back into itself, and you just keep doing this. And this is, this is the feedback dyad. And it turns out that um, this, per, this version is the only interpretation that's consistent with quantum mechanics particularly with the mechanism concept in IIT. Um, because in quantum mechanics, what you have to realize is there are three things. There's, there are states, there are systems or subsystems, and there are transformations. So in regular IIT, they, they kind of cheat a little bit. They use the classical concept of a logic gate, which is, is 
people kind of skirt around this issue a little bit, but they think of logic gates as possessing a state. But logic gates don't really possess a state. Logic gates are just a relation between two systems that have states themselves. Um, and so it's better to think of these things as states, systems, and transformations. Um, in particular, states are associated with subsystems, not transformations. Transformations don't have a state. That's just a relationship between the two. OK, so why is this dyad uh, conscious in IIT? So the present state of the dyad predicts both the future state and the past states with certainty. So if you know you have this dyad, and for example, um, at t equals 0, um, a has the value 1 and b has the value 0, then you know if this dyad is a swap gate, you know that at t minus 1, a was 0 and b was 1, and you know that at t plus 0, a will be 0 and b will be 1. Because it's a, presumably, it's a completely deterministic system in this sense, OK? So both the past and the future states are known exactly if you know the current state. So the way you calculate the uh, integrated information for this dyad is you replace the internal causal connections with noise. So the IIT is famously difficult to, to calculate uh, phi for. Um, and even this simple like this is the simple, simplest system in IIT, and even this is, is a little complicated. Um, the whole algorithm, if you look at IIT 4.0, the whole algorithm, like they have, a, they have a shortcut algorithm that's like two pages. Like the, the whole thing is something like seven or eight pages of calculations. Um, luckily, they have software you can use to, to make it a little easier. But anyways, you, you, you re replace the internal causal connections from A to B with noise, which results in an information loss. So for example, um, A's effect information, so this is small phi for the effect, is based on just this, this sort of standard um, uh, mutual information calculation. So the phi for A being in state 1 is, this is the probability that B will be in state 1 at t plus 1 if A was in state 1 at t equals 0. It's the same with this. This is the same thing except we replace A with noise, which in this case, since it's a binary system, is just 0.5. So the noise, it's just a half. It's like flipping a coin. If you, if, if you have noise and you don't know if it's a binary system, well, it's 50-50, one way or the other. And so this calculation gives a phi of 1. You do the same thing for B, and it also comes out with a phi of 1. So the cause information is actually calculated in a slightly different manner, which highlights the fact that IIT has this inherent time asymmetry that I don't know if they, they realize it. I don't know if it's a bad thing or a good thing, but it's there. And it's, it's curious to note that, that it, is, it is there. Because the, the cause information is calculated um, this way, where it's a similar calculation, so at a is 1 at t equals 0, its cause information is what's the probability that b was 1 at t minus 1 if a is 1 now? That's what this probability is. This probability is what's the probability that a is 1 now if b was 1 previously? So this first one is actually calculated according to, to Bayes' rule. So it, there's a Bayesian updating here. Um, and the p a equals 1 and p b minus t minus 1 equals 1 are both unconstrained probabilities whose values are both a half, meaning if you know nothing about it, it's basically the same thing as noise. So if you, if you go through the calculation, you plug the numbers in, you, you, get, a, a prob, you get a phi of 1 for um, the cause information for a, and the same is for b. So, so now you have four pieces of information. You have phi e for a, and phi c for a, and phi e for b, and phi c for b. So you have, these are the small phi's. But they still don't tell you the exact 
five for each of them. The way IIT works is you have to then take the, the, so the actual integrated information of each part of A and B is calculated by taking the, the minimum of their respective cause and effect information values. And there's a complicated reason as to why it's the minimum. You can read through IIT to, to get the sense of that. And I'm, because I'm running out of time, I'm not going to go over that. The dyad's total integrated information at some time T is then the sum of A's contribution, the sum of B's contribution, and the contribution of any internal relations in the system. And there are none in the dyad, so that's zero. So the integrated information of the dyad is two. So that is the minimally conscious system in IIT, and it has a five, two. Now, the dyad actually has four possible states, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one each of which has the same phi value. So each of those should represent a qualitatively different experience. They all have the same phi value, but they are a qualitatively different experience. So I could experience red versus green. There's no reason that I would expect the experience of red to be, have a greater consciousness level than my experience of green. They, they, should, be, they should have the same phi value, but they're different experiences. So we can actually represent each of these four states as a matrix of probability distributions. I'm running out of time, so I won't go through the, the details, other than to say that um, uh, these are our representations of what we call the Q shapes. So the Q shapes are represented by a matrix of probability distributions. Um, so we can then create, can we form a superposition of the dyad's conscious states, which would be a superposition of two of these. And can we do that? And the answer is yes, we can. We can feed um, into, we can, we can, if we adopt a, a quantum uh, system, we can feed, say, a zero and a plus state into our dyad at t minus one. And you run through the process, and you end up getting a, a superposition of the zero, zero state and the one, zero state. Um, so yes, you can create a superposition of states, which of course then suggests, well, but we never experience a superposition of these states. It doesn't happen. So this is where we introduce uh, a, the dynamical collapse model that um, Chalmers and McQueen first started talking about. And it's, it's based on a generalized collapse model developed by um, Bassi et al. And it looks like this. And the collapse operator has this form. So it's got a bunch of eigenvalues. And so one of the things that we, we require is, so this would, be, this would be the consciousness collapse model that we're talking about. Any consciousness collapse model should arguably, arguably imply the following for any choices of the eigenvalues of this operator. If the two states of the dyad are qualitatively very different states of consciousness, the experience of green versus the experience of pain, assuming that pain, you, green doesn't cause you pain, um, they're qualitatively very different, then those superpositions of those states should vanish very quickly. Like nobody's ever presumably experienced that kind of a superposition. There might be states that are, that are a little closer, some qualitatively that you could argue maybe. Um, but in any case, we then assume that the, the absolute value of the difference between their eigenvalues should be very large. And we can define a distance between the Q shapes in a cer certain arbitrary manner. Um, the paper has details, which allows us to formulate this, this principle, which um, I call for our purposes here, Q shape distinguishability. If the distance between two Q shapes is large, then the distance between their eigenvalues of the collapse op operators must also be large. And then we can, the eigenvalues then can be defined in terms of an optimization problem. So we have an optimization problem to de determine these um, eigenvalues for uh, the collapse operator that's de dependent on the difference between the, those qualitatively different states. And this is, of course, just for the simple dyad here. But the idea is that you would then, you can scale this up, which is obviously a question of whether you can do that or not. Now, there are two complications with this. The first is that the number of Q shapes is not necessarily equal to the number of collapse operators. And in fact, it can be shown that 
Just for the dyad, there are 27 actual collapse operators. Um, as Marcus said at one point, he's like, he, he, he said, nature, that, that seems rather extravagant for nature. Like, why would nature have 27 collapse operators for a simple dyad? So that raises some issues. In the quantum IIT, distinct states of consciousness do not always correspond to mutually orthogonal quantum states, which means that there's even more, um, which suggests that there's got to be a fundamental limitation either for this collapse model or for IIT or both. So maybe we just have to limit ourselves to collapse uh, to classical uh, classical states and that we really can't consider these um, all mutually orthogonal quantum states. So in summary, the feedback dyad is the smallest system to which a non-zero value of phi can be assigned. The dyad's got four possible states which can be put into superposition uh, with one another, which goes a step towards answering Wigner's original prob question about whether when does collapse occur? Wh um, can you have these superpositions of conscious states? If so, you know, how does, the, how does the collapse occur? We can write down a dynamical collapse model to try and answer that, um, where the time scale of the superpositions um, is sort of related by the eigenvalues of the collapse, collapse operators, which is found by an optimization scheme. But unfortunately, this also leads to some complications, which, meaning that the collapse operators, the number of them may be excessively large, um, which introduces some things that we have to work on uh, a little bit more. Um, funding for this was provided by FQXI, and uh, thank you.